welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode six of the Look Back with Mac podcast. I'm Michael McKenzie. I'll be your host for today's episode. In today's episode, we're going to be doing a 2020 NFL draft recap. It was a fun three days for the NFL draft, an exciting three days, a lot of shocking picks, some reaches, some steals later in the draft. Uh, I had actually gone on the YSN draft party for rounds one, two, and three on the first two nights of the draft, discussing stuff with uh, Rick Daly. So you, if you guys want to go check out some bits and pieces of that, you can. But uh, we're going to be going over the draft recap. I've got the script right here that we'll be uh, going with in a few minutes here. But I've got some of the uh, notes from the draft that I still have right here. We're going to be going over some of the reaches, sleepers, and stuff like that in the first and second rounds. First, we're going to talk about the... Eighth overall pick, Isaiah Simmons to the Arizona Cardinals, and we're going to dive right into it. The most versatile player in the draft, Clemson's linebacker, Isaiah Simmons. He can play safety, he can play linebacker, he can play edge rusher. You might want to throw him on a deep tackle if absolutely necessary. He's a very versatile player in the draft. I'm surprised the Giants didn't take him. They took the third best lineman in the draft in Andrew Thomas. And then the Panthers with a surprising pick, surprising team that passed Simmons up, taking Derrick Brown Jr. from Auburn. But the Cardinals get a very versatile player on the defensive side of the ball, and that's another piece they're trying to add to Cliff Kingsbury's team. They got Kyler Murray last year. They've got Kenyon Drake at running back. I think they took a running back in the later rounds of the draft, if I'm not mistaken. But they got DeAndre Hopkins and Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk at a wide receiver. Maybe it would have been nice for them to build up that offensive line. But that doesn't matter because they ended up taking Josh Jones later in the draft, which I'm going to go over what what category that puts – the Cardinals in in winners and losers. We're going to be going over the best draft performances, worst draft performances, some of the questions following the draft, and some of the uh, moves that will impact the playoff picture immediately. Sorry, I didn't uh, go over what we're doing after we go through these uh, draft notes that I had written down. But yeah, Simmons, a big steal there for Arizona at number eight, and a lot of people had him going number four or number seven to either Carolina or New York. So Big steal for the Cardinals, especially in their rebuild process. They're trying to get back to the Super Bowl for the first time since 2009 when their hearts were broken by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Next week, we're going to talk about number 15, the Broncos getting their wide receiver and Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy is the Alabama receiver that can break off some big plays. But the impact this has on Denver, they did take K.J. Hamler later in the draft at the second round, a receiver that a lot of teams would would have been liking to take in the second, maybe early third round. We'll get into that a little bit later, but Jerry Judy is a wide receiver that can be added to that receiving core. There's a veteran presence on that defensive side of the ball. They didn't need to address that as necessarily big. They didn't have a bigger need to address that defensive side as they did on that offensive side. Get Drew Locke some help. Uh, Maybe draft a running back later, but um, mainly that offensive line and that receiving core. Yes, they have Noah Fant at tight end, and yes, they have Courtney Sutton at wide receiver, but they got rid of Emmanuel Sanders, so they needed to I will replace him and then maybe get another receiver later, which is where the KJ Hammer pick comes in. But I didn't see that as an absolute absolute necessity. Maybe address something on the defensive side, maybe a secondary player, uh, but or an offensive lineman, but not get a second wide receiver. But Jerry Judy is a guy you can throw in there to that Denver uh, wide receiving core, and he can be a big piece in Denver's future as they try to compete with the Chiefs in the AFC. Uh, I believe it's the AFC South that is becoming very, very, very competitive, especially with the Chiefs in there just steamrolling that division. So the Broncos need to make this division as competitive as possible. Next pick we're going to talk about, we're going to number 17. C.D. Lamb goes to the Cowboys, and this is a steal for Dallas, but I, I at, the, at the time I was skeptical about the pick. They need to take a secondary player or maybe an edge rusher, a Yitor Gros Matos, uh, Clavion Chasen was still – on the board at this time. He ended up going to the dra- Jaguars. Uh, three picks later, maybe a Yitor Gros Matos, if I hadn't say, said his name already. Uh, in the secondary, get a Xavier McKinney, Grant Delpit, Trayvon Diggs, who they actually selected in the second round. We'll go over that pick in a little bit as well. But the Cowboys get CeeDee Lamb, another weapon for Dak Prescott to throw to in that receiving core, which now contains Amari Cooper, CeeDee Lamb, and Michael Gallup. And you got Ezekiel Alley in the backfield. Travis Frederick did retire, so that is a need that I thought needed to be addressed in the second round maybe the third round for the Dallas Cowboys, but they did end up getting a replacement in the later rounds for Travis uh, Frederick. But uh, C.D. Lamb, a steal for the Cowboys, but still, at the time, not a necessary pick, and I still don't think it's an absolutely necessary pick with all the other areas of needs 
that the Cowboys needed to address and get immediate help at. 19, Raiders make this pick, and they reach for Damon Arnett from Ohio State, who I believe was second round talent. He becomes the second uh, defensive back to be taken from Ohio State in the first round, and he's the, set, I believe, maybe seventh or eighth first rounder from Ohio State since 2013 from the defensive back position. Since 2013, Ohio State has had every starting defensive back selected, including seven to seven or eight first rounders. I forget if that stat was after Damon Arnett had been picked, had been picked, or before Damon Arnett, or after Damon Arnett had been picked. So I believe it's seven. I believe that was after Damon Arnett had been picked. But if it's not, that makes it eight. Still, that's a lot of defensive backs to be selected in the first round from Ohio State, and that makes them DBU. Maybe that's why Damon Arnett can't got picked this early. You know, he's got some, he's got talent. A lot of people want him in their secondary. But where he comes from, Ohio State, his origins going into the draft, coming from the, I believe, undisputed DBU is the reason that Damon Arnett goes number 19 to the Las Vegas Raiders. Raiders. Next, we'll talk about the number 23 pick. The Patriots traded away the Chargers. They really don't like picking in the first round. They picked Nikhil Harry, wide receiver from Arizona State, last year. This year they traded away, and Harry didn't really turn out last year. Once he came back from injury, it really wasn't too much of a spark for that offense. So they go and trade this pick to the Chargers, and they take Kenneth Murray, linebacker from Oklahoma, the best defensive player from Oklahoma in recent history, definitely in recent history, to enter the draft from the Sooners. And I had him going 16. I think this is definitely a steal. The Chargers can pair him up, pair him up with Melvin Ingram and Joey Bosa on that defensive side of the ball. They got Justin Herbert early in the draft. So the Chargers, they had a pretty decent draft. Give them credit for what they, have, what they did in these last three days. The Chargers put together the best team that they possibly could. They don't really have much of a fan base to present that team to. But they're putting together a decent team. Don't be surprised if the Chargers throw their hat into the AFC South ring in a few years. There's still a lot to happen before that. There's still a lot that needs to happen before the Chargers are a contender to maybe even make the playoffs in the first place. But, you know, these last three days have been a very good start for the Los Angeles franchise. Next up we're going to talk about is the Packers taking the eventual replacement for Aaron Rodgers. Jordan Love, the quarterback from Utah State, they traded up four spots to get him, and they needed wide receivers. There was a lot of wide receiver talent here. As I mentioned, K.J. Hamm was still on the board, Michael Pittman Jr., T. Higgins, just a few of the big names. Still on the board that the Packers could have traded up and got, but they take the Utah State quarterback. And Aaron Rodgers is under contract until 2024, so I don't know why Matt LaFleur could have picked here. Maybe it, it's just the world's justice or karma for Aaron Rodgers after he was picked number 24 to the Packers during the Brett Favre era where a lot of Packers fans really were skeptical of that pick too because, you know, Brett Favre is still a very good player. He's still leading the Packers to NFC championships. And they took Aaron Rodgers at 24 after. He, he wanted to go to the 49ers. I think that was his, I'm 99% sure that was his team growing up. But the pick... Is Jordan Love here, number 26? And maybe it's Matt LaFleur, a 30-year-old coach. He wants to pick, get his quarterback. He, as a young coach, had some tension with Aaron Rodgers in the offseason. That was patched up, and they made it to the NFC Championship game. But maybe Matt LaFleur wants to coach his own guy. He wants to build his own player from the ground up. He wants to take Jordan Love from this NFL rookie that nobody really believes should have been even a Green Bay Packer in the first place. He wants to take him to the next Packer great quarterback. I think that that is the most logical reason for this pick of Jordan Love. Next, The next pick is going to be the one we're talking about, and it is a huge reach. Number 27, the Seahawks take Jordan Brooks, linebacker from Texas Tech, and he was ranked 111th in the CBS Sports Prospect Rankings. He's a, he was a third-round potential guy, and he goes first round. They didn't even have a camera or anything set up in his house because they thought he was going day two. They thought there was, nobody thought there was any chance he was going day one. And the Seahawks take him up with linebackers on the board, such as Zach Vaughn and Patrick Queen. That is a very interesting pick by the Seattle Seahawks. A very big reach for Seattle's franchise, especially 
with the talent that was already on the board. I thought they were taking a linebacker, but I thought it would be either Zach Bond or Patrick Queen, and they were both still on the board at that time, and they didn't go with him. Next, the Chiefs, Clyde edwards Lair, the 32nd pick. This is the last first-round pick we'll discuss. Uh, we've got about maybe five, six picks to discuss in the second round, which we will. Uh, the Chiefs take Clyde edwards Lair out of LSU, and with the running back still on the board, such as DeAndre Swift and Jonathan Taylor, a lot of people thought this was a reach. But about an hour or two after the draft, we're diving into this. We're realizing this is not a huge reach at all. If you look at the uh, scheme, the offense that Andy Reid in Kansas City runs, it's a pass-happy offense. It's about throwing the ball again, again, and again, and again. They just won a Super Bowl with Damian Williams and LaShawn McCoy at running back. Damian Williams is an inconsistent guy who can show flashes, but he's not really a stable in that offense. And LaShawn McCoy is nearing the end of his career. That was just an offensive off-season signing after the preseason cuts for Kansas City. And they need to get a guy who can be a stable in that offense. And Clyde edwards Lair, the best receiving back in the draft, most people regarded him as. This is the correct pick for the Kansas City Chiefs, especially with the scheme that they run. So once you dive into it, it might have been a reach. He was probably still available in the second round. But it's the perfect pick for the scheme that Kansas City runs. That's it for the first round picks. We're going to go into the second round. Uh, we're going to start the number three pick, the Lions. They take DeAndre Swift running back from Georgia. Not a lot of people saw the Lions taking a running back in the first two rounds. But then you look at it, there has never been a running game there for Matt Stafford. He's had his receivers in Calvin Johnson. He's got Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones Jr. there right now. There's been a little offense. There's been little offensive line talent, but it's been there more than a running game has. They addressed defense by getting Jeff Okuda in the first round. Now you got to get him a running back that he can throw to or hand the ball off to, and that is DeAndre Swift. He's as comfortable in the slot as he is standing next to Stafford in the shotgun. So the Lions pick up a running back here, someone that is probably best fit to complement Matt Stafford in the offense. Next we're going to go with the sixth pick, 38th overall. The Panthers take Yitor Grosmatos, edge rusher from Penn State, and they took Derrick Brown Jr., so they take two defensive linemen while they passed up on Isaiah Simmons. So that is the thing that really confuses me. If you're going to take a defensive end, another defensive lineman, here in the second round, why are you passing up on the most versatile player in the draft by taking another defensive lineman? That is the only thing that really questions that I have questions about. But Yitor Grossmontes, I bet they didn't think he was going to be there. And he's probably too good to pass up. They need help on that defensive line. So they take Yitor Grossmontes. And, you know, I can't vouch for Panthers fans that wanted... Isaiah Simmons, because I think that these two defensive linemen could really make this team a lot better on the defensive side of the ball. But I definitely think that passing up on Isaiah Simmons makes a lot, of le a lot less logical sense with this pick. 12th pick, 44th overall in the second round. Browns take safety Grant Delpit from LSU, an absolute steal at this point. Maybe some can compare him to Greedy Williams for last year. Browns had a second-round pick in need of a secondary player. And there's an LSU guy on the board that a lot of people thought could have gone in the first round. And the Browns take him. Greedy Williams last year didn't really do anything last year, but Grant Telpit this year, their Thorpe Award winner for LSU, maybe he can do a little more than Williams did in this past season for Cleveland. I hope not as a Steelers fan, but you've got to look at this pick as a pretty good pick for Cleveland. 14th, 46 overall, the Broncos, they take K.J. Hamler, another guy that they can throw into that receiving core that can be a, uh, that can quickly be a guy that can impact the Broncos' offense. Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, K.J. Hamler, and Noah Fant, the four main targets for rookie, last season rookie quarterback. Now, first year, second year quarterback, Drew Locke. So that offense is shaping up to be pretty good. That veteran presence on the defensive side, we'll see how far that can carry Denver next season. 19th pick, 51, 51st overall, the Cowboys take Trayvon Diggs from Alabama, a big steal here for the Dallas Cowboys. They needed to address that secondary position in the first round or an edge rusher, and they didn't. They took C.D. Lamb, a wide receiver. Well, they already had Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup in that, sec in that wide receiving court. But they get first-round talent at nineteen at the 19th pick in the second round, 51st overall. 
So Jerry Jones did a pretty d dang good job in these first two rounds, drafting a guy that can make the Cowboys receiving core the most dangerous in the league. And then still drafting a first-round caliber, very talented defensive back from Alabama, Drayvon Diggs. Great job by, Jer by uh, Jerry Jones on his uh, little private yacht that he was uh, doing the draft from. Uh, now we're going to go to the 23rd pick in the second round, 50 55th overall. The Ravens take J.K. Dobbins, the most underrated running back in the draft, in my opinion. I thought he should have gone 17 to Pittsburgh, if not four, uh, if not a, uh, excuse me, 13 to the Buccaneers, or seventh to the Dolphins, or ninth to the Colts. Those are picks that I thought running back could go. But J.K. Dobbins goes to the Ravens. He gave me a nice complimentary piece for that Ravens offense that is option heavy. They love to run the ball. Uh, they can take a lot off of Mark Ingram who is getting older. He's got a lot less to give in the tank, especially he, he's not really an endurance back at this point. He's a guy that you've got to rest every other possession so that you can get as many miles out of him as possible, so that you can get as much out of the tank as you possibly can. And J.K. Dobbins is a perfect complimentary piece for Mark Ingram at that running back position. One more pick to talk about here in this second round, and then we'll go over some of the notable picks. Just I'll just go through who they are, uh, not really dive into it. Um, I will dive into three. Excuse me, I'll dive into four or five. 29th, over, 29th pick in the second round, 61st overall, the Titans take Christian Fulton, defensive back from LSU. A great steal for Tennessee here. They got a nice, strong offensive lineman in Isaiah Wilson from Georgia, earlier as a 29th pick in the first round. And here in the second round, they get first-round caliber secondary player in Christian Fulton. So two first-round caliber players for Tennessee. And they needed to, if anything, they needed to boost on their team. It was that defensive side of the ball. They got Derrick Henry at running back. They just extended Ryan Tannehill. They got a nice offensive line. Maybe one little gap they filled up with Isaiah Wilson. Uh, you got some decent receivers out wide. So you just need to address that secondary, some of that defense. And they got a nice first-round caliber guy in Christian Fulton. So now let's go over some of the notable picks. First, we'll start with the third-rounders, Josh Jones, the Houston lineman. He goes to Arizona, and that's what I was mentioning earlier, for two first-round type guys go to the Cardinals. And this kid falls to the third round. So that is a huge deal for Arizona. Two steals for the Cardinals in this draft. They could be looking very good next come next season. Linebacker Zach Bond from Wisconsin. He goes to the New Orleans Saints. New Orleans traded up to number 10 in the third round to get Zach Bond, this linebacker, who I thought also should have gone in the first round, if not at least mid to early second round. He falls to the third round as well, the number 74th overall pick. He goes to New Orleans. The number 16th overall pick, 80th overall. This isn't really a notable pick for you know a lot of people that don't live in the Youngstown Ohio area, but Lynn Bowden, wide receiver from Kentucky, goes to the Las Vegas Raiders. He is a kid that went to Warren High School, so a lot of people were rooting him on to go in this draft from Kentucky, a wide receiver quarterback, any type of guy on offense, that, unless it's an offensive line. He could play really anywhere on that offensive side of the ball from Warren High School, from around this area, and he goes to the Las Vegas Raiders. So that is just a local pick right there that I just wanted to mention. Notable fourth round pick, 16th overall, 16th in the fourth, 122nd overall, the Jacob Eason quarterback from Washington goes to the Indianapolis Colts. Now it's a question of what does happen, what happens between Joe, Jacoby Brissett and Jacob Eason once Philip Rivers leaves the Colts. He's going to be there for a year or two to kind of let these guys learn under him. But now that they've got two quarterbacks that can move into that starting role after a couple of years learning under a veteran like Philip Rivers, who's it going to be? We'll discuss that later. In the show, um, next notable fifth rounders, Bryce Hall, from defensive back from Virginia, goes to the Jets. Thought he would go in the third round, maybe the second. Uh, 19th, 161st overall, Curtis Weaver, defensive end slash linebacker from Boise State. He goes to the Miami Dolphins, so that's a good pick up there for Miami, a third round caliber guy falling in the fifth round. And then 22nd, 167th overall, Jacob, Jake Baum, quarterback from Georgia, goes to Buffalo. A lot of Seagulls fans are pulling for him to go to Pittsburgh, especially after Jalen Hurts gets picked by the Philadelphia Eagles, probably the reach of the draft. Uh, but he falls to Buffalo, the offensive coordinator there, the former offensive coordinator at Alabama. He saw Jake Fromm play in the SEC championship game and in the national championship game, so he knows what Jake Fromm can do. And that is, and he told the GM and head coach, you know, this kid's too good to pass up on. You cannot let this kid fall, even if we have Josh Allen. So Jake Fromm 
the Buffalo backup for the for a few years. Notable sixth round pick, a guy who I thought should have gone in the th- in the third round as well, thirty first, two hundred and tenth overall, Prince Tega Wa- Wanago, offensive tackle from Auburn, goes to the Philadelphia Eagles. So that's a good pick there for Philly in the sixth round, and then the notable sev- seventh rounder, sixth uh, pick in the seventh round. Excuse me, I thought I was going to sneeze. Two hundred twentieth overall, KJ Hill, wide receiver from Ohio State. He goes to the Los Angeles Chargers. Another guy who can be an immediate impact, a guy who I thought should have gone at least in the fourth round, if not the third or the fifth. And he falls to the seventh, to the Los Angeles Chargers. He was probably the biggest surprise dropping as far as he did, him and, prob- him and probably Josh Jones. But K.J. Hill goes to the Chargers, and that is it for you know notable picks, uh, looking at some sleepers, some steals, some reaches, and... Now we're going to go into some of the fun facts. This is going to be mainly from the first round. So Jeff Akuda is the first defensive back selected in the top three since Sean Springs in 1997. Both were Buckeyes, furthering the Ohio State DBU argument. Ohio State takes the lead for the most first-round picks overall and most picks in NFL draft history. In the first round, they have 84, leading over USC's 82, and overall, they have 173 picks taken in the draft. So Ohio State, they, could they be NFL year? Could they be the school that teams want, that players want to go to to get that NFL career in the future? That is definitely going to be a huge argument for Ryan Day and his recruiting, which is already off to a hot start. We'll talk about that in the next episode. LSU had five first-round picks last night. Not last night. In the first round, I have this written down as last night. I was uh, on a couple of shows, uh, Running Point with Ron Potesta and Power Hour, that I had these written down for. It was before the second day of the draft. So LSU had five first-round picks, becoming the fourth team to ever do it, the fourth program to ever do it. This has been done multiple times, more than four times. It's been done um, twice by Miami, once by USC, and twice by Ohio State. So that makes LSU, this being the sixth time this has happened. Every starting defensive back at Ohio State has been drafted since 2013, seven in the first round. Mentioned that earlier. And the SEC set the NFL draft record on the fir- on night one with 15 first round selections. So those are just some of the notable fun facts from the first round and somewhat overall of the draft. Now into the actual script. First, we're going to go with the best draft performances, the five teams that did the best, in my opinion, in the NFL draft. The Ravens. Pick, taking Patrick Queen in the first, J.K. Dobbins in the second, then Justin Madu BK, Devin DuVernay, Malik Harrison, and Tyree Phillips in the third. Four third round picks. They added value to all areas of the field. Linebacker Patrick Queen, a dude who can drop into coverage, make plays in the middle of the field. Patrick Queen is probably the best pick for that uh, Ravens defensive scheme. You got J.K. Dobbins, I mentioned he could be a nice complimentary piece to Mark Ingram in the backfield now that you're trying to get as much out of him as possible as he. Uh, enters the uh, the back stages of his career. He doesn't have very many miles on him. Uh, Justin Madu BK, de- defensive tackle, somebody that they can add to the, that defensive line that can mo- complement Calais Campbell, who they just got from Jacksonville for basically nothing. I think it was a fifth round pick. So that's a guy who can, from Texas A&M who can complement Calais Campbell on that defensive line. You got Devin Duvernay from Texas. They needed to add a wide receiver that can help out with Marquise Brown in that wide receiving core. Another guy that Lamar Jackson can throw to after the departure of his name slipping my mind right now. They just traded him. I think it's Hayden Hurst. So that's a nice guy who can be another target for Lamar Jackson. Uh, Malik, excuse me, yes, Malik Harrison, another linebacker that can drop into coverage. I think he can be a guy that can switch out with Patrick Queen every three or four drives. That is why Malik Harrison was picked, an inside linebacker who is a mainly coverage guy, but he can also be sent in on a blitz. So a guy who can be compared to Patrick Queen, but a guy who can also swap out with him every now and then that could add a lot of, um, can be very good for those two. Um, Malik Harrison gets playing time. Patrick Queen cannot wear himself out in the early stages of his career. And then Tyree Phillips, a guy, an offensive guard who, and the Ravens need needed to replace Marshall Yanda. Tyree Phillips is the guy who can replace Marshall Yanda. Yanda retired for the Ravens, so they needed to fill that gap in the offensive line, and Tyree Phillips is that guy. And this was all in the first three rounds. So the Ravens with a fantastic first three rounds of this draft. And these, these picks, I'm going to go over the picks that made these teams the winners and losers of the draft. 
most of these are going to be the first uh, picks from the first three rounds. The Dolphins, winners number two. They took, picked up Tua Tunga Bailoa, Austin Jackson, Jeff Gladney, Robert Hunt, and Raekwon Davis, and Brandon Jones. Tua Tunga Bailoa, he's going to be the next franchise quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. Austin Jackson and Robert Hunt, two guys who can block for Tua, especially considering the lack of offensive line in Miami. Jeff Gladney, a defensive back from TCU, a guy that they can add to that secondary with the Brandon Jones. And um, there's also a guy there forgetting his name as well, a sign from the Cowboys, signed away from the Cowboys. Uh, if I think of his name, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you guys, but uh, Brandon Jones and Jeff Gladney, a couple of defensive backs that can help out in that secondary. Uh, they added a media impact to offense with Austin Jackson and Robert Hunt being able to block for Tua, but those guys secondary, they can be guys that can help maybe help this year, but I see them as being future value guys on that defense. So Miami drafted for this year and for the future. They had a pretty good draft. The Lions, in their four picks in the top three, took Jeff Okuda, DeAndre Swift, Julian, Aqu Julian Aquara, and Jonah Jackson. Jonah Jackson, a guy who can be added to that offensive line to help block for Matt Stafford. Jeff Okuda can be a guy that they can add to that defensive backfield, which has been lacking. Uh, he, maybe he could be the next Darius Slay there in Detroit. He had a lot of value. He ended up being traded to the Philadelphia Eagles. And you got DeAndre Swift, a guy who can try to compliment Matt Stafford, try to give him the best possibility of actually having a run game, which he hasn't had in his entire career at Detroit. And then Julian Aquara, a guy who can both blitz and drop back in coverage just about in similar uh capacities. They address all the major areas of need without drafting multiple players at the same position. A lot of teams you can see doing that, like Patrick Queen and Malik Harrison and the Ravens, they both drafted inside linebackers. They can both drop back into the coverage and blitz. Uh, the Dolphins, they took Austin Jackson and Robert Hunt, two great offensive linemen that can block for Tua. But the Lions in their first three rounds of picks did not draft the same position multiple times which is a main reason the Lions are one of the winners of this draft. Arizona Cardinals next, Isaiah Simmons and Josh Jones. Two picks, both first-round caliber guys. Josh Jones can really help out on that offensive line, help block for Kyler Murray, which he, he was just in an absolute panic last year. So Josh Jones can maybe attempt that rebuild of that offensive line for Kyler Murray, the reigning offensive rookie of the year. And then Isaiah Simmons, the most versatile player in the draft. Again, they got two steals, the most versatile player in the draft, and first-round caliber offensive lineman. So that makes the Cardinals a big winner with only making two picks in the first three rounds. Next, the Jacksonville Jaguars. They are our final winner of the draft. They took C.J. Henderson in the first, which some people thought was a reach from Florida, but he was not going to be there at number 20. I think that they would have... I think that they had a better bet at getting a Utah Dos Matos, Clavon Chasian, or a... Uh, Javon Kinlaw, who ended up going to the 49ers at 14. But they they had a better chance of having one of those three guys there than a Xavier McKinney, C.J. Henderson, or uh, Christian Fulton. I thought all three of those guys were going to be gone by the time the Jaguars picked at 20. So I don't think it was a reach at 9 to take C.J. Henderson because I think that there was a lot of DB value in this draft, especially with the teams that needed some defensive backs. Clavon Chasen, there at 20. I mentioned there was a better chance of him being there at 20 than C.J. Henderson. So they took the gamble with C.J. Henderson to hope a guy like an edge rusher or a defensive lineman falls there to number 20, and Chasen does. Number 14th overall prospect according to CBS Sports Rankings. I had him going number 17 of the Cowboys. Maybe a little bit of a fall for him, but um, good pick up there for Jacksonville. LaVisca Chenault Jr., their second-round pick. A wide receiver from Colorado. Maybe he can help out in that wide receiving core, which is basically just DJ Chark at this point for Gardner Minshew to throw to. So they're going to be handing off the ball a lot to Leonard Fournette if he's still there by the time the season rolls around. But LaVisca Chenault Jr., maybe he can be another target for Minshew to throw to in the future. And then Davon Hamilton, a defensive tackle from Ohio State. Again, that NFL U. They've been having a lot of defensive linemen have a lot of NFL success. Uh, Joey Boza, Nick Bosa, and then you got Chase Young, the drafted number two overall. So Davon Hamilton goes to the Jacksonville Jaguars in the third round. They added players who can all be leaders in this rebuild. That is completely being torn down right now. Once Leonard Fournette is traded, then they can start building up. 
And these are guys that can be leaders in that rebuild process of the Gardner Minshew. They're all guys that are going to be the foundation of the rebranding and rebuilding of Jacksonville Jaguars football. Next, we're gonna go, Now we're going to go over to the worst draft performances, and we're going to start with the Green Bay Packers, who had the worst of them all. It took Jordan Love, A.J. Dillon, and Josiah DeGuara. They drafted zero wide, receiver this, wide receivers the entire draft. No help for Aaron Rodgers. They drafted his replacement. They drafted at positions they already had talent at, such as running back with A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones. They don't really have a necessity for a tight end as much as they did for a wide receiver. They may, may have needed to draft on defense maybe in this in the first three rounds. But they took Jordan Love, the eventual replacement for Aaron Rodgers. We all think so. A.J. Dillon, a guy who can back up or maybe be a third string to Aaron Jones and Josiah Deguara, who is a third-round type tight end, who is not really a guy that I believe you can throw into the mix as an everyday, every-down tight end. Next, the Las Vegas Raiders, as much as I hate to say it, especially with Lynn Bowden going there, but they took Henry Ruggs, Lynn Bowden, and Brian Edwards. That's three wide receivers in their first four picks. They had a chance to get one of the top two wide receivers in Jerry Judy and C.D. Lamb, and they passed on that. They took a secondary player in Damon Arnett, who a lot of people believe is a reach. So Las Vegas did not draft their best. Last year, they took Claylin Farrell with the fourth overall pick, but they did take Josh Jacobs later in the uh, draft, at the, I believe at number uh, 28, who ended up being in the conversation for the rookie of the year. But taking three wide receivers in your first four picks and then reaching for a defensive back in that other fourth pick doesn't bode well for the Raiders, especially with their fan base is excitement. It went from probably about here to here. With, even with the move to Las Vegas. Next, the Atlanta Falcons. They have A.J. Terrell, Marlon Davidson, and Matt Hennessy. They addressed a variety of positions, some that they needed to improve at, such as that secondary, even though they still do have Desmond Trufant there. They still needed to address the secondary. They need to get depth at that position. But they, again, they're reaching at times. A.J. Terrell was the 25th overall prospect. They could have had Kenneth Murray, who's a top 20 prospect. Uh, Marlon Davidson, they do might they might need to address that defensive tackle, defensive line position, but that's a reach from Auburn. He's a third-round type guy. And Matt Hennessy, a fourth-round type guy that they take in the third round at the center position. So they passed on a guy in Kenneth Murray that really could have helped out their defense to take A.J. Terrell, and then they reached for guys that there were better players at at that specific position. So the Falcons really didn't do the best that they could have. There was a, just a few things. If, if they take a better defensive tackle and a better center and they don't pass up on Kenneth Murray and they don't reach for A.J. Terrell, they might be in the winner category of this draft. But they're in the wor they might be in the best draft performances of this uh, chart I have here. But they're in the worst. Next, the New England Patriots. We'll see how this pans out. But they took Kyle Duggar, Devin Asiasi, and Dalton Keene. They drafted two tight ends in the – third round and they really didn't have, they had a need for that tight end but they didn't have a need to go out and take that UCLA wide receiver of CSC and then take Dalton Keene afterwards they don't need two third round type wide receivers as much as they need a quarterback to help replace Tom Brady they didn't need a second round defensive back with Xavier McKinney and Grant Delpit and uh uh, Trayvon Diggs was on the board and Cray Christian Fulton. They didn't need to take this D2 kid from Leonore Ryan University. I'm starting to think his Husky actually, B Belichick's Husky actually made the pick. And they, again, they didn't address that quarterback position which they needed to address with Tom Brady's departure. Unless they plan on taking for Trevor in 21. They're planning on that and they didn't take a quarterback. Whatever. But Belichick came out and said, that no quarterback taken, that was not by design. They wanted to take a quarterback, and they didn't. That kind of baffles me. Next, our final loser, and some people have this team as the winner. I think that they're losers. I'll tell you why. The New York Giants. They took Andrew Thomas, Matt Pert, and Shea Lemieux. Those were three of their picks in the first five rounds. They took three offensive linemen. Even though they got a steal on McKinney in the second round. Let's address that. They got Xavier McKinney in that second round. That's a pretty good steal. 
but they passed on Isaiah Simmons at four overall, the most versatile defensive player in the draft, maybe one of the one of the best defensive players in the draft. And they took a lineman to do so, which they took three linemen later in the draft, so it shows that they could have taken a lineman later and taken Isaiah, they could have taken Isaiah Simmons and still taken a good lineman later. And that line and that offensive line position had a lot of talent in it throughout the entire draft. So it's really weird that they passed up on Isaiah Simmons, a player on defense that they could have greatly used to take a lineman, a tackle to be more specific, that they were going to take one more of later and take two offensive linemen later. And it sh that shows the great value that was at that offensive line position in this draft. But I just think that that's a, those are stupid decisions made by the New York Giants. So that, those are the, the best draft performances and the worst draft performances right there. Now we're going to go into some, to some of the draft moves that will immediately affect the NFL playoff picture. First, I've already mentioned it multiple times, Isaiah Simmons to the Arizona Cardinals. That is a tight race there, but it's against teams that are elite in the 49ers and Seahawks. The Rams made it to a Super Bowl a couple of years ago. And then they went 8-8. Eight eight. So there are three teams there that are above 500 or at 500, and then the Cardinals are sitting at five and uh, at, uh, excuse me, four and eleven and one, maybe five and ten and one. But they get a very big steal in Isaiah Simmons, and then Josh Jones, the guy who can help protect Kyler Murray. We could be seeing a four-team race in the NFC West as soon as this year. So that is a huge move that will greatly affect the NFL playoff picture. Next, Chase Young to the Redskins in an NFC East division that has no real competition. You've got the Cowboys, who are 8-8. Eight eight. Yes, they did just add Trayvon Diggs and CeeDee Lamb, but they're the Cowboys. They'll find a way to mess it up. We'll see if the new coach, Mike McCarthy, can do anything. But again, it's the Cowboys. I think they're going to mess it up. You've got the Eagles, who passed up on Justin Jefferson to take Jalen Rager. And then they take Jalen Hurts in the second round. Why would you take Jalen Hurts when you need to take another wide receiver? And why didn't you trade up to take CeeDee Lamb in the first place? There were a lot of mistakes made by the Eagles in this draft, so they're going to stay at that 8-8, eight 7-9 eight, place. And then the Giants are the Giants. So the Redskins are sitting third right now. And then they get the best defensive player in the draft in Chase Young to go along with Montez Sweat on that defensive side of the ball. If they're off, if Dwayne Haskins can get going to what people think that he's going to be, and Terry McLaurin, that um, fourth round pick out of Ohio State, can do what he did last year, this Redskins team in this NFC East could be sneaky good. And next, Jeff Akuda and DeAndre Swift to the Lions. Yes, it's an NFC North division that has the Packers, who went 13 and three a year ago, the Vikings, who snuck into the wild card, the Bears, who uh, have tried to get their name into the playoff picture. They knew, now have Nick Foles. They got rid of Mitch Trubisky. And the Lions are sitting in last behind everybody. But Jeff Okuda, that defensive back, can be a leader on that defense. And DeAndre Swift can give Matt Stafford his first chance to have a real running game in his entire career at Detroit. And with the Packers taking Jordan Love, they might not have Aaron Rodgers come this time next year. Or maybe by the start of the season. I think that there's going to be a lot of tension in that locker room, and it's not going to bode well for the team chemistry. The Vikings... Stephon Diggs is out the door, and they took Justin Jefferson as a replacement, who I think is going to take a, need a year or two to develop. The Lions could sneak up and surprise us all by maybe making a sixth spot in the wild card, or maybe pulling off a shocker of all shockers and winning the NFC North. Who knows? Only time will tell. Now we're going to go into our biggest questions following the draft. And if you guys want to answer these questions yourself in the comments, make sure you do so because these are some questions that have pretty open-ended answers. They're going to be a lot of, you know, things people, answers people have to these questions. First, what does the future hold for Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay? I think that it holds a trade within a year. He is, by this time next year, I will guarantee you he is not in a Packers uniform. Maybe by the start of the season. Who knows? But I think the future holds for Aaron Rodgers and Green Bay very little. Very little. 
The only way Aaron Rodgers is in a Packers uniform by this time next year is if he wins the Super Bowl, which I don't think will happen with Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers, the tension that they've already had, and now I think it's going to come to a boiling point where Aaron Rodgers tips over and eventually requests his trade, which the trade request will probably be fulfilled. Now, I, now there's a conspiracy theory floating around about, about why no receivers uh, were taken in the draft. There was a birthday party for the GM that he was holding for himself at his house. I can't remember his name right now. He invited everybody, and everybody said he was going to go. Everybody said they were going to go. Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Jones, all those guys. And nobody showed up. So maybe this is the retribution for that. No wide receiving help for Aaron Rodgers. Let's draft his replacement. Let's get Aaron Jones' replacement in A.J. Dillon. That, that, I mean, that's a conspiracy theory. But I think it's a logical reason why they picked him, the Matt LaFleur, wanting to build his own guy. I think that that is what happened. Next, are the Steelers and Patriots really comfortable with their current QB rooms, or are they waiting for next year? The Patriots tank for Trevor, more than likely already in process. And they didn't draft a QB. QB that wasn't by design. That has been said. But maybe they're trying to trick us into thinking that so that they can get that tank for Trevor movement going. And then they'll take the Clemson quarterback who has been NFL ready since he was 19 years old. He's been NFL ready for two years, according to everybody. And for, as go, far as the Steelers goes, I think that they should have taken Jake Fromm or Jacob Eason with their third-round pick and not Alex Highsmith at outside linebacker slash edge rusher. I don't think they had a big as big a need at that position as they did for a backup quarterback, a future quarterback, unless they're content with Mason Rudolph or Duck Hodges. I do not think that that needs to be the future. Duck Hodges is a D3 guy who just had some stats. He is not ready to go and play as and start as an NFL quarterback. Maybe Mason Rudolph gets another shot, but I really don't think he should get another shot. It is evident that neither of these two quarterbacks are going to be the successors to Ben Roethlisberger. So the Steelers need to go out and try to get one this year. If not, next year. Because there's going to be quarterback talent in that draft next year. With Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. Do the Steelers tank for Fields? Do they trade up and get Fields next year? They traded up to get Devin Bush last year. Traded to their first round pick this year to get Minka Fitzpatrick. Could they trade this year's first round pick up to get Justin Fields? I think that both of these teams have to seriously consider either tanking to get some of these top tier QBs next year or trading up in next year's draft with the absence of quarterbacks in their draft classes. Did the Dallas make a big mistake not loading up on that defensive side? Yes, they got some defensive players, and they got a defensive player, a nice secondary guy in Trayvon Diggs, but they didn't load up on defense like a lot of people thought they would. They actually took a James Madison quarterback who uh, used to play for Pitt, I think. Um, I, his name, I think it's a French name. Um, who He transferred from Pitt to James Madison. I think it's like Danucci or something like that. But he goes, I think, in the seventh round of the Dallas Cowboys. They really did not address the needs on defense. They had a huge need to take defensive players, and they didn't even come close to addressing it. So is Dallas going to regret that this upcoming year? Again, only time will tell, but I think that it is going to be a big regret from Dallas that they don't load up on that defense. That they, they didn't load up on the defensive side, the defensive side to try to get some help this year or in the future years. It might cost them a year or two a setback because of that absence in defensive picks that they needed to make. And then our final question following the draft. This is the last thing we'll do, and then it'll be over. This is not really a draft-related question, though. Who are the Saints going to go with once Drew, Brees, once Drew Brees retires? Because this today, in the morning, at about 10 a.m., Taysom Hill signs a two-year, $21 million extension. So now people are thinking, okay, this is why they didn't take a quarterback in the draft. They do believe Taysom Hill is the future, which I believe is a huge mistake. But they do believe that Taysom Hill is the future. So my hair keeps sticking out. But they do believe. I think it's it was evident at 10 a.m. that they do believe Taysom Hill is the future. And then 11.30 rolls around. And Jameis Winston is signed by those same New Orleans Saints. So now it's, is Taysom Hill really the future? It's, I have,
have no idea why they signed Jameis Winston and they extend Taysom Hill at the same time. That's a huge waste of cap space, especially considering a two-year, $21 million contract with signing, bonuses at, with signing bonuses. Adam Schefter put it this way. It's a one-year, $16.5 million, con $16 million contract for Taysom Hill. That's a lot of cap space to waste on a guy who's probably going to be a third-string quarterback. So why did they extend Taysom Hill? Are they going to convert him to a wide receiver? Do they have a plan for Taysom Hill? Because Jameis Winston, he's not going to be converted to anything. He's going to be a quarterback his entire career. Taysom Hill has shown that he can be a different position other than a quarterback. So maybe that's why he got extended. But I still think that you extend him and then you sign Jameis Winston. Taysom Hill, a guy you, who you have openly spoken that you believe is going to be the next in line for that QB position really doesn't add up and make sense. Leave your thoughts about that and other uh, topics that we discussed in the comments below. But that is going to wrap it up for Episode 6 of the Look Back with Mac podcast. It has been a nice, fun time doing the draft with you guys and stuff. And apparently I'm the new uh, draft guru, draft insider here at YSN. But thank you guys for tuning in to Episode 6 of the podcast. Episode 7 will be coming soon. We'll be discussing some recruiting news from Ohio State and anything else that pops up in the world of sports. Uh, we'll discuss what ha might happen when the NBA comes back as they plan to reopen facilities on Friday. But uh, this is Michael McKenzie signing off for now on Episode 6 of A Look Back with Mac Podcast. Make sure to tune in for Episode 7 next week.